Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Amen. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord today. need y'all to pray for my voice. I got a little excited in the early service. And the old gray mare ain't what she used to be. <laughs> oh, my boy. Turn with me, if you would, Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7, I want to begin reading in verse 15, and we're going to kind of carry over a little bit in chapter 8. And I want to deal with this morning something that every single human being on the planet deals with. Every one of us in this room today deal with this issue in some form or another, in some degree or another. Many people today are not reaching their potential, and they're not reaching their divine destiny with God because of this. Many people outside these four walls this morning that are away from God, many of them are away from God simply because of this issue, and it's the issue of condemnation. God has been dealing with me, and I've shared some of that and kind of set a prelude to ministering to you today about how detrimental and how paralyzing condemnation can be. Because with condemnation always comes a heavy weight and a dark cloud. But I am convinced that God more than ever before in our lives and in no other time than what we are in history right now, God wants His church and God wants His people to rise above condemnation and live in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Let me remind you that whom the Son is set free, they are free indeed. Hallelujah. And we are free to worship, we are free to walk, and we are free to war the good fight. And I believe today, as we have seen already in the early service, people are going to break free from condemnation. If you would look with me, Romans chapter 7 and verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that, is it, that it is good. Now then, it is more, no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members or my body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members or my body. Paul here is having a warfare much like you and I do. And he is warring against the spirit and the flesh. And then he comes to a moment like many new, many of us have come to, in verse 24, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, one of my most favorite scriptures of all, Paul says this, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. 
For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And may God be exalted in the reading of His Word. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. There are many types of guilt that each and every one of us face. And today I want to address a spirit of self-condemnation that causes a continual black cloud of guilt and despair that seemingly never goes away. And this type of guilt is not based on a sinful act or actions, but it is rather a general attitude that dominates one's life and keeps them from moving forward into the will and purpose and plans of God. And I want us to look back and I want to draw through the Scripture uh, that we had just read what Paul was saying and who he was saying it to and the context by which this backdrop unfolds. And I believe that we can ascertain today that this is exactly where many of us are and where many of us have been. Now notice in verse 15, Paul says, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I would or will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate to do, that is exactly what I find myself doing. Have you ever been there? So, the question is, where does guilt come from? In fact, guilt comes from a troubled conscience, and it comes from self-judgment based upon a perceived misconduct. I want to say that again. Guilt comes from a troubled conscience and it comes from self-judgment based upon perceived misconduct. In other words, guilt says, I don't understand what I'm doing and I do that which I hate to do and I hate what it is that I'm actually doing. See, the law can only reveal sin. It cannot and will not remove it. The only thing the law could do was to show you and I that in our flesh, in our body, that we could not live without sinning. So even when we try to use the Bible to remove guilt, we feel even worse because the Bible reveals or unveils the sinful nature. And it is only through and by the blood of Jesus and by the working of the Holy Spirit in us that we are able to overcome sin and its consequences. Now, notice in verse 17, Paul says, But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, or that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I do not find. For the good that I would do, I do not. The evil I don't want to do, that is what I'm doing. Now, if I do what I will not want to do, it is no longer I that does it, but it's that sin nature that dwells within me. How many of you have have, have done these these kind of things? Man, I really want to do better. I'm going to do good. I'm not going to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And man, I'm going to do everything better. I'm not going to do any of these bad things anymore. And then no sooner than you walk out the door, you find yourself failing and failing and failing and failing and falling and falling and falling. And you just feel like, what a, what, what a wretched individual. All right. I want you to listen to the lament of Paul in this text. In fact, Bible scholars tell us that Paul was literally uh, referencing or he was answering back to letters that he had received from the congregation at Rome. 
And it sounds like any other, con it could have been a congregation from Radford. It could have been a congregation from Richmond or Roanoke or, or Rock Hill or anywhere. It could have been anywhere. And, and, and I want you to listen to him. I could imagine the letter going like this. Dear Paul, we got a problem. I do what I hate to do. I hate what I am doing. I can't help myself anymore. I feel like nothing good dwells in me. I try hard, and the harder I try, there seems to be a sin in me that keeps me from doing what is right, and I feel overwhelmed by guilt. And I want you to listen to what this text is saying. It's saying basically what you and I say to ourselves almost every day. I can't do right even when I try because my conscience is too troubled. And when I try to do good, I can't. And I try not to do evil, but that's what I end up doing. What is my problem? Is it really a sin in me that makes me feel this way? Absolutely. Absolutely. The answer is yes. But it's not the answer you and I think. The constant state of guilt is not coming from God, but rather it is from a sin deep inside of us, and that sin, ladies and gentlemen, is called pride. See, when in balance, it is a good thing, but if it ever gets out of balance and it, and it ever gets uh, uh, heavy to, to the negative side, it will de be destructive to our life and our future. In fact, the Hebrew word for pride means literally two things. On one side, it means excellence. On the other side, it means uh, arrogance. And if we go into the Word of God, to the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, we find a very, very uh, telltelling um, uh, fact about pride. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2, the Bible said that when pride comes, then comes shame. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, it says, By pride comes nothing but strife. In Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 3, it says, In the mouth of a fool is the rod of pride. And then the one we're most familiar with in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18 pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You see ladies and gentlemen the problem ain't with sin. The problem is with pride. And this troubled conscience doesn't come from God. It comes from a voice inside of us that says if I don't do all the right things no one is going to like me. If I don't perform well uh, then uh, uh, everyone's not going to like me if I don't say the right things if I don't do the right things and if I don't uphold a certain image no one is going to like me this kind of sinful pride ladies and gentlemen hurls itself into self condemnation on a person's life and destroys their future and destroys their potential and destroys their destiny and by the way this is exactly what religion says Hello? Religion says you got to look right, act like, dress like, and be like everybody else or you don't fit in. Amen? I got a phone call the other day from a dear brother. Wanted me to come by his, or his office. And we had a conversation for about an hour and a half. And in that conversation, we got to talking about this thing called pride. And I made a statement. The Spirit of God began to stir my heart about something. We were talking about different things that had gone on uh, over the course of the last few years. And uh, he, 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 was, he was being a, a, a friend and a mentor to me. And... The Spirit of God spoke to me, and, 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 and I said this to him, Tom. I said, so many times we find ourselves trying to save our name at the expense of saving our heart. I won't say that again. We many times are so concerned about saving our name that we do it at the expense of saving our heart. What I mean by that is we want to look right. We don't want nobody to look 
at us, you know, in disregard. We want to we want to present ourselves well, but many times we waste all our enemies saving our name instead of saving our heart. I remember a long time ago, I, I was going through some difficulties. Uh, uh, we uh, at the church then we were getting a lot of people saved uh, that were uh, drug addicts and alcoholics and some of the major drug dealers in the area and and rumors started flying imagine that and i remember that they were throwing out rumors like yeah he's just using the church as a front to sell drugs and and all this stuff and he's letting people come into the church that don't live right well what are we there for, by the way? Amen. And he, you know, just all kinds of these rumors, Judy, that we were letting down our, you know, our Pentecostal standard, whatever in the world that might be, and and you know, and all of that stuff. And and I got real frustrated with. It. I got mad. I got angry, and I got resentful. And so I go to this uh, brother that I had a lot of confidence in, brother Pastor or brother Kaiser, my pastor and my mentor, had done gone on to be with the Lord. And I went. And seen, uh, 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 he was a district overseer at the time. His name was Bradley Year. He has since passed and went on to be with the Lord himself. And I went over to his house. And I, I, basically, I was wanting somebody to get on my side. Y'all know what I'm talking about. We all want somebody on our side. Especially when we want to do something real mean and bad, don't we? I was like, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, but I'm going to be the tool that he uses. And, you know, you know, God's got to have a vessel. Bless God, I'm going to be the vessel by which his vengeance comes raining down. So I go over to his house, and he had this little old swing he always sat in, had a couple lawn chairs there. Well, he was swinging back and forth on that swing, and I was telling him how, you know, woe is me, blues despair, and all we needed was a hound dog to pet on. And I was telling him, you know, everybody's against me, and he was like, well, you know, what, what, what's happening? With, well, the church is growing, you know, we're seeing people coming to Jesus, baptizing 30 and 40 people at a time, and he was like, then what's the problem? I said, people talking about me. He, he laughed at me. I said, this ain't the guy I'm looking for. He started laughing at me. He he kind of held his head back. He said, son, I'm going to tell you something. You'll learn it somewhere down the road. But I'm going to tell you now. He said, it's always good to keep them talking. He said, keep them talking all the time. He said, whether they're talking good or bad about you, just keep them talking. He said, because as long as they're talking, that means you're doing something. Amen. He said, as long as they're talking, whether it's good or bad, just keep them talking. And I know what some of you are thinking. Boy, did I take that advice. Because for 30 years, I've kept them talking. <laughs> well, you didn't have to laugh out loud, Mildred. He said, as long as they're talking, they'll never forget you. These people never will forget me. Amen. But. What his point was, it didn't matter. And then he made this statement. Many of you have heard me say it many times. It really doesn't matter if you're living your life with a Bible in your hand or with a bottle in your hand. People are going to talk about you anyhow. Amen? Can I get a witness? So just let them talk. Amen? And so here, here we find ourselves with this spirit of pride that has us wanting to save our name and not our heart. This type of pride is crucial to relationships, uh, relationships because a person's whole security, satisfaction, and, and, and trust is based upon an idea of perfection. Because in some regards, anything at all is wrong, then all is wrong. How many of y'all have ever planned a date? I knew you'd get that one. Hi, honey. She's in the nursery, by the way. Cut the signal. Yeah, right. Don't. For 30 years, of, or 32 years, 32 years, 32, Michelle and I have always planned 
every week a date day. Always, we've always tried to. And I don't care if it's a date. I don't care if it's a trip. I don't care if it's a vacation. Now, I, I draw this conclusion by years of research dealing with people's marital problems in and out of the church. And more times than not, women have admitted that while you're in that moment of making everything right, if one little thing goes wrong, everything is wrong. Amen, brother. It's divine providence that she's holding that child or you'd be slapped upside the back of your head. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? We're going on a date. We're going on a trip. We're going on something. We're going to go on something special. This is going to be a great time. I don't care. It doesn't matter if you answer the wrong way, if you give the wrong answer, or even if you give the wrong look while you're giving the answer. Well, this day's ruined. Can I get a witness? Guys, say amen. Y'all know what I'm doing? Ladies say, that's the truth. That's the truth. Don't nobody get mad at me. You know it's the truth. The truth sets you free. I mean, we... What did he say? I couldn't hear him. So you set everything up and we think everything has got to be perfect. And when the one thing is not perfect, it destroys everything. And that's a reflection of our lives. Amen? What, this past Tuesday was what? Valentine's Day. The day of all love. Well, I was working. Michelle was keeping the grandkids. So we said, I think it was Wednesday, Thursday, whatever day, we'll go to, no, Friday, we'll go to lunch. We'll have a nice lunch. Well, I get up after working a 14-hour shift. I'm dragging through the house, walking like Fred at Sanford. She gets up, dressed all nice. I'm like, Get some energy, get some energy, get some energy. We're going on a date. Well, the longer it took me to get ready, our date turned into chicken noodle soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. But we were fine with it. We finally realized we're getting at that age, we can have a great time just being alone without nobody in the house. No offenses, girls. And no offense for the grandkids. I mean, just so we're at that age, we can chill, and 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 it's good. But how many of you know we we set that up? We we set something up, whether it's a trip, vacation, a date, whatever it is. We set that up that if one little thing goes wrong. You know, there's been things that, and I'm like, it only took a minute for that to go wrong. We got 23 hours and 59 minutes to go. The odds are still in our favor. Work with me. Can I get a witness in the house? All right, let's move. Let's move on before I dig a little deeper. Now, watch though. This type of guilt is not coming from God nor from, from, from others or from us. It's coming from an idea that everything in life that is important must deliver either a perfect or near perfect performance in order for us to be happy. I am so thankful. 
that I have been delivered from the religious idea that every Sunday I got to come, Judy, and perform. Amen? I'm so thankful that we can just come together and be who we are. Amen? That we don't have to perform. Oh, I can. I can walk pews and do everything. Amen? But that's, that's you know, well, y'all know what I mean. We're not here to perform. We're here to get closer and closer and closer to Jesus. Amen? Now, so this breeds in us this idea that it's either perfection or nothing at all. Now watch what Paul says. Verse 21. Well, I find then a law that is that evil is present with me, that the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, and my, he's saying my spiritual man wants to do the right thing, but I see another law in my members, in my body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my body or my members. Then he says, O wretched man that I am, who can deliver me or who will deliver me from this body of death. So, what do I do? What do I do? What do we do together to get rid of this self-condemnation? My mind is at war with my conscience. I delight in God's Word, but my mind tells me I can't live it. My soul says more of God, but my mind says you can't handle what you've got, much less anymore. Right? So where do we go? See, the more I condemn myself, the more that I struggle in my mind, the more I struggle in my body, and as I condemn myself more and more, the worse I get, and when I feel more guilty than before, I do more bad things, and in the midst of that guilt, watch this, in my guilt I complain more, I fuss more, I accuse more, I scream more, I overreact more, I judge more, and I expect more from others than I'm willing to give myself. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me? Who is it that can set me free? Who is it that can take away my guilt? Look what Paul says next in verse 25. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but the flesh the law of sin. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there is someone who can take away my pain. God did it through Jesus Christ. Jesus did what the law couldn't do. Jesus did what sin couldn't do. Jesus lived that life of perfection for me and you. Alright? How do we get over this? How do we get by this? Look at Ephesians chapter 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, because, everybody say because, because of His great love wherewith He loved us, Even when we were dead, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul was saying that Christ delivered us. Why? Because of His great love toward us. No other reason. You can't attain it. You can't earn it. You can't walk up a ladder to get it. It's simply because He loved us. And He loved us the same as ever. While we were yet dead, 
when I was in drugs, when I was in alcohol, when I was doing all of those things that I was doing, yet God loved me enough to bring me out of my degradation, out of my sin, out of my death, and saved my life. Wow. Wow. Why? 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 Because of his love. His love. And then he did three things. Look what it says in this scripture. It says he made us made us alive together. We are a lively bunch. Amen. Why are we lively? Because Christ has made us alive. He made us alive together. The next thing the Bible says he raised us up together, and then he made us to sit together. With Him in heavenly places. We ain't alone this morning. Jesus is sitting here among us. Amen. And then, He goes down a few verses in Ephesians chapter 2, and then look at verse 8. For by grace ye have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man would boast. Now, the why is that is because that He loved us. The how... Is by His grace. Somebody tell me what grace is. Hmm? Unmerited favor. We didn't earn it. Unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. Unmerited favor. By His grace we are saved. Somebody tell me what mercy is. Mercy is us not getting what we deserve. Amen? You ever been pulled over by a cop? A few times. Times a few times. And when I pick my when I see I always keep my registration and my insurance card clipped inside of my I got a county deputy badge where I've been a chaplain and so I kind of hand it all to him and if that don't work I say you know my son-in-law don't you He's, he works with you you know Trooper Dunford yeah that's my son-in-law hey don't laugh it helps But every time I've been, I can't speak, every time I have been pulled over, I know I deserve it. Amen. But what what do you feel when they say, I clocked you at 85 in in a 55 and I could give you, you know, reckless driving, yada, 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 yada. But I'm going to let you go this time. What do you feel? Evidently, you just failed it. Which one are you? One, she's like, yeah, that was you, all right. What did you feel? You was like, Whew. thank God. Some of you break out in a full Pentecostal rant. Oh, hallelujah. Bless you. Start bucking. I used to, but my neck hurts now. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Because we knew we just got off with what we deserved. And how much more and how much deeper and how much wider has God shown His mercy to us? And every one of us in this room deserve death, hell, and the grave, but yet He's given us mercy. Amen? If that doesn't get you in the mood to worship God when you come to His house, nothing will. Amen? Now, look, look, look what the writer of Hebrews says. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, he says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. The King James says we have a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And I love what he says in verse 16. He says, Let us therefore now come boldly 
boldly to the throne. That word boldly means with confidence. Let us therefore now come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find the grace. There it is. Grace and mercy. Come boldly, come with confidence to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find the grace to help in our time of need. Hallelujah. When you need grace and mercy, all you got to do is come with confidence. He's got it. Amen? Now, how do we get over this? How do we get past this condemnation? See, if we understand grace and mercy, watch this, we realize that we don't have to live in guilt because there is grace. We don't have to live in condemnation because there is mercy. See, we, we, we understand that our righteousness is as filthy rags, but God sees me not as I am, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Let me show you. God just worked this out today. Because in the first service, Quentin was here. How many of y'all know Quentin? Big old Quentin. We got a big Jesus. Amen. Got two big Jesus. Now, I want to show you something. The Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. But the Bible also tells us just as clearly that our righteousness is in Christ Jesus. So, He is the mediator between God and man. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace because Christ is standing in our stead. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our our infirmities or our weaknesses. So, He stands between God and us. Watch this. So, I have Jesus standing in front of me. You all can't see me. So, every time God looks at Jerry Collins, he sees Jesus first. And even when Jerry Collins stumbles, come with me, Jesus, when I stumble, he still sees Jesus. When I fall, he still sees Jesus. No matter what happens, he still sees Jesus because I am the Bible says that I am hid we are hid in Christ Jesus so everything of my imperfections God does not see because he sees Jesus amen thank you brother amen we think we're the ones that have to hold all this up mm mm then why did Jesus die on the cross? All we got to do is live in Him. He is our righteousness. And in Him, we live and move. And the Bible says, we live and move and go about our being. Now, let's, let's wind this up. So if I understand that my righteousness is filthy rags... But God sees me in the righteousness of Christ. The Bible says, look at what Paul says in Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation. No one's condemning me. If, I, if I'm condemning myself or if people are condemning me, that's not God, folks. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What is that telling me? That's telling me I don't have to have a perfect world. Amen? I don't have to condemn myself. I don't have to condemn others. I can accept the fact that life is not perfect, but Jesus is. I can I can I can live with the fact that life will let you down, but God won't let you down. I don't have to have a perfect life. I don't have to have a perfect family. I don't have to have a perfect spouse. I don't have to have perfect children. You see, pride tells us that if we don't, we're failures. But that's pride. I gotta look good. I gotta seem good. And if I seem good enough, 
then people will think I am good enough. Are y'all getting this? So, Jimbo, where you at? Yeah. <laughs> y'all get ready here. I'm, I'm going to wind this thing down. See, Jesus on the cross signed my pardon. He set me free and whom the Son is set free as I said a moment ago. We are free indeed. See, there is no perfection, ladies and gentlemen, except in Him. Amen? How many of you struggle? I want to do good. I want to do good. I want to do right. I, I I want to. I want to read. I want to study. I want to pray. I want to witness. And when something goes wrong, you look at yourself and say, "Man, what a failure!" That's who we are. That's how we operate. That's how we function. See, that's that's the worldview, and the worldview tells us that you've got to be somebody to be somebody but the truth of the matter is if I am in Christ I'm already somebody so let's get back to the root of the problem here so what is the cure for guilt what is the cure for condemnation what is the cure for this shame and guilt that I feel four things to take a note, write this down. First of all, you need to confess the sin of pride in your life. Yep, it's pride. You got to remember, it's not about my name. It's about my heart. If I say my name at the expense of my heart, I've lost everything. But if I save my heart and lose my name, I've still gained eternity. Amen? Because not... None of us. We don't. None of us like being talked about. We don't like rumors that flow against us. But guess what? It's going to happen regardless. Amen. It's called life. So, first of all, we got to repent of that pride and say, confess it and say, God, I realize I'm being prideful about this. Secondly. We need to forgive ourselves. Do you hear me? You need to forgive yourself for everything you have put people through because of your pride. Because all the other things are a byproduct of your pride. Then thirdly, you need to forgive those who made you feel like you were failing when life wasn't perfect. Because let me tell you something. People will expect perfection out of you. The minute you say, I'm a Christian, oh, I get this all the time. People walk up, oh, you're a preacher, ain't you? Yeah. So what? And? I had a guy come to me the other night at work. He said, so, and when he said that, I thought, he said, so, you're a preacher. I was like, oh boy. I knew something was coming, Judy. Then he goes on this big spiel how his girlfriend is one of the... He said she's a clairvoyant. And I'm like, this is going to get interesting in a hurry. And he says she can conjure spirits and talking about all these spirits in the house and all this... And then says, you know, do you, come, do you go to people's house and pray those things out? And I couldn't help myself. I said, not if they're inviting them. I mean, I'll do it, I'll do it in the New York second if them things are showing up unannounced. But if you're inviting them, I ain't coming to deal with them. And I commenced to telling him, Tom, I said, listen, I, I've, I've, I've been around, I've, I've, I've been a part of, of casting a demon out of people. I don't, listen, I don't go around looking for that. I mean, we got guys that 
That's my ministry, casting out. Well, good. Go on about your business. The ones I've dealt with, I don't want to deal with them no more. <laughs> and I told him, I said, well, let me just give you a little tidbit. I said, me or 10,000 others cannot cast a demon out of nothing or nobody if they don't want them out. I said, so if somebody asking them in, they got to want them out before they can go. So people, they label you all the time. Oh, you're one of them Christians. Oh, you're one of them Pentecostals. Or, or oh, you're one of them Freedom Fellowship people. See, some of y'all got that. Cause, yeah, y'all that breakaway bunch. No, we're that free bunch. And, 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 uh, and, and we deal with that and we, we take it personal like, oh, I've got to fix something because people think I'm imperfect. Guess what? The reason Christ died on the cross is because we are in fact imperfect and we always will be. None of us in this room today is perfect. So we've got we to understand. We've got to repent and forgive those who made you feel less than perfect because of unattainable expectations. And then last of all, you need to accept the grace of God. And you need to realize that your guilt is not coming from God. It's not coming from the Word of God. But it's coming from a false view of what life is supposed to be like because of the sin of pride in your life. That brings the guilt. See, it's the pride that breeds out the guilt, the shame, and the condemnation. We need to accept that this life that we're living right now is not perfect. But if all you're ever doing and trying to do is to live your life in perfection, you're going to miss out on the true treasures of life that are built not by materialism or not by you reaching somebody else's expectation, but in the relationships that God puts in front of you. Amen? I have seen people divorce and destroy their lives and others and their families' lives because they were trying to reach a level of expectation. Trying, let me say it this way so we can... I've seen people's lives destroyed, marriages destroyed because somebody was trying to keep up with the Joneses. Y'all understand what I'm saying now? Trying to make a name Instead of trying to mend a heart. Amen. So let's don't put these unrealistic expectations on others. Let's don't, for God's sake, let's don't put them on ourselves. You are who you are by the grace and the mercy of God. Amen. No, you're not perfect. And every one of us are, are works in progress. Amen. Amen. None of us have reached the goal yet. If we would have, we'd be raptured like Enoch was. I ain't seen nobody flying through the air lately. So none of us have gotten there yet. Just be who you are. God loves you for who you are. Amen? And you need to get rid and you need to move past that guilt and shame and condemnation because whom the Son is set free, they're free indeed. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who are walking after Him. Amen? Would you stand with me this morning?
so many times so many of us fail to get to the next level because we're weighted down by the guilt and the shame of not performing see the level is not met by our ability to perform our level is met by our relationship with Jesus Christ and as that relationship becomes fulfilled then as you get that vertical relationship right then the horizontal relationships become a lot easier and those happen at the cross a vertical relationship with God a horizontal relationship so it flows to me through me and it's amazing how I've watched people grow Tom when we lift the expectations just be who you are amen I look around and see different ones of you that once you got to the place you could just be who you are that's when you started growing but when you was trying to be like everybody else and do like everybody you you remember those days they used to plant them right there on the wall y'all know what I'm talking about the do's and don'ts of being like us we don't do this we don't do that you can't go there or you can't wear that Remember those days? And they'd plant them on the wall. We're proud to be who we are. Yeah, you are, I guess. And then they would put expectations. I remember being a young Christian and having a man come to me, point me out, build it and say, you can't live like that. I'm like, man, I just got saved. I'm still learning. We don't do that around here. See? And that brought upon me a weight of guilt and shame. But thank God I had some, bro- some brothers in Christ that came alongside of me and said, you just be who you are. you got to take care of the rest. And I just sensed in my spirit for the last couple of weeks that there are people today that you're, you're feeling that weight of, of guilt and shame and condemnation. But God wants you to be free. God wants you to be free. God wants you to be free to, 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 to march forward. God wants you to be free to reach your potential. God wants you to be free to walk in the divine destiny that God has planned for your life.